All right. Well, uh, our last uh, event for PLMW at ICFP 2021 is we have Professor Mike Hicks from the University of Maryland. He's going to talk to us about um, thinking about the impact of our work. Um, you know, so if, if we're doing research in some sense, we want to affect change in the world, whether that's how people think about a problem, how what techniques people use, there's some impact we're trying to have. So having the conversation about like, well, what sort of impact do we want to have uh, is an important part uh, of this uh, community that I hope we start talking about more. I think this is the first time we've had a, a talk like this at PLMW. So I'm personally very excited. Uh, and so Mike, take it away. Thanks, Jose. All right, let me uh, share my screen here. All right. Everyone can see that or Jose, can you confirm? Yeah, it looks great. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, right. So I'm Mike Hicks. I'm at the University of Maryland. I'm a professor there and I'm uh, part of the programming languages at UM um, Plum Group. And I'm happy to be here today to tell you about my opinion about increasing the impact of programming languages research. So way back in 2014, I was having a conversation with a colleague of mine uh, this is really kind of a, a made up conversation, but it actually reflects the truth of conversations I was having around then. So, you know, it gets to be uh, mid fall and I say, yep, we need to hire in uh, programming languages. Well, you know, let, let's do that. And my colleague says, well, why should we do that? Why should we burn one of our slots on a programming languages person, especially since, you know, PL, it's kind of a solved problem, isn't it? No, 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 there's of course lots to do. It's a, it's a thriving community. Uh, really? I mean, what is it that all of you people are doing? Well, of course, we're doing work on programming languages. Okay, but, um, you know, don't modern programming languages work pretty well? We use them all the time. Uh, people get stuff done with them. And in any case, you know, aren't most languages developed by non-academics anyway? Why do we need to hire professors to do this stuff? Well, because um, there are still big research contributions to make. Um, industry doesn't, doesn't do everything. Okay, like what? Hmm. So it was at that time that I realized that I needed to start thinking about selling PL in the sense of knowing what it is that we're about and why, uh, what is our place in the set of areas that make up computer science research. So in, that was around 2014. I started a blog then called the PL Enthusiast. So you can see the moniker there on the left. And um, this is with Swarat Chaudhary at the time. He left after um, a, a year or two and I kept running it forward. And then in 2019, while I was on the SIGPLAN executive committee, I started PL Perspectives, which is the current SIGPLAN blog. So now that's in good hands as well. And both of those efforts have tried to get the word out about the impact and uh, interesting results in, in programming languages research. So as part of both blogs last summer, I uh, was reflecting again on this question of the place of PL research in the world and maybe how we could do more to increase the impact of that work. And so this talk is taken from that post. Um, so afterwards, of course, you could watch the recording of the talk, but you can also go over to that post and, uh, and see it all recap there. Um, one thing that I was wondering about when they, when uh, Lindsay and Jose invited me to give the talk was, you know, why am I giving this talk to you? PLMW attendees. You're just starting, say, a graduate student career. You're thinking about programming languages research. Maybe you're a senior level undergrad. You're thinking about it. You know, uh, why are you the right audience to answer these, to, to receive my wisdom, if you will, about these bigger questions of, of impact? And I think there's two answers to that. So first of all, one, you'll get my take on what PL research is. Maybe that will be useful to you. And that might help you think about work you might do and uh, the basis of the impact of that work. And uh, in any case, you're actually in a position now to more easily actualize some of the things I'm talking about. You're in the process of choosing problems to work on, of developing collaborations, of deciding which uh, research advisor or group you wanna work with, what strategies you're gonna take for doing your research. And all of those things can affect the impact of your work. So uh, seeing this talk may help you think about some of those choices that you are now or will soon be making. Okay, so let's jump into um, a little bit of background. So uh, programming languages is often referred to casually as an area of computer science. And I feel like this, um, I had a breakthrough when I realized that an area is not what I thought it was. Uh, an area is a collection of methods 
So foundational mathematics, notation, vocabulary, algorithmic techniques, and it is a collection of hard problems and ambitious applications around which those techniques have developed. So really an area started with problems and then over time to solve those problems, a bunch of mathematics, notation, methods, and so on developed. But then those methods have independent value uh, and they can be applied to other things. And what you see is that over time, the owners of the solvers of those hard problems, the community of say programming language enthusiasts um, start to have a sense of both their problems and their methods. And they think of them interchangeably. So I think of myself as a PL person, even when I'm over solving security or quantum computing or database problems, because the methods that I use come from what were traditionally solutions to PL problems. Um, at the same time, my machine learning friends who maybe foray over to programming languages to do machine learning for you know, code generation or something like that, probably still think of themselves as machine learning people, uh, even though they're working on PL problems. And so the thing is really, it's both. And it's both in the sense that the community developed both together. So the little uh, chart there on the left is the CS rankings uh, problem areas, or, or sorry, uh, CS ranking CS areas. And you can see they roughly correspond to a, a, SIG, a um, ACM SIG. And the, the area for PL has the four main SIG plan conferences. So let's talk about those problems um, and areas or, or uh, methods for a minute. So PL as an area, surprise, surprise, began with the fundamental problems of programming language design and implementation. So, um, you know, in, in the 50s, when, when folks were inventing Fortran, they were faced with problems that no one had ever solved before. How do, how do I write a program in a high level language and translate it down to code that a machine can actually run? Uh, up until then, people were writing programming languages that were not too far away from the machine itself. I mean, for the ENIAC, for example, people were programming a thing by plugging different cables into different outlets. Only later did things like resembling assembly language arrive. And then finally, something like Fortran introduced a huge space of problems in language design and implementation. And of course, immediately following, you wanted to start thinking about things like, well, what do your programs mean? How do I know that when I compile and run this Fortran program, it's gonna do what I mean? That's a semantics question. And if I wanna prove that my program always you know, produces a positive number, well, how do I do that? Well, that's a, a proof verification number. So a lot of these problems that were explored in the 50s, 60s, 70s um, uh, are, are really important fundamental problems that, um, that the entire computer science community was thinking about. And you can see that uh, the first POPL was published and uh, came about in 1973. I was gonna do the first ICFP, but that's a little boring because that's not till the 90s. So the first POPL anyway was, it's one of the oldest uh, PL conferences. Maybe it is the oldest, yeah, it is the oldest. And so um, what were the topics? Parsing, uh, the design of new language features, uh, compilation, even proved correct compilation, optimization, uh, how to formalize types and semantics, automated programming reasoning, right? So all of these problems and methods that grew out of them have been the subject of 40 follow-on years of research. Okay, so as an example of a computer of a, a classic PL problem, um, let's look at parallelization. So here is a um, quicksort program in Haskell. So what, is, uh, what does the quicksort program do? Well, it's going to uh, split some uh, variable. Here it's, it's not really quicksort, I should be fair. It's just taking the first element of the list, X, and then it's uh, sorting, uh, it's splitting XS in two according to the, the values that are less than X and the values that are greater than X, and then it's concatenating them together. Real quick sort would select the pivot element, element randomly, but here we're just selecting the first one. Okay, so let's say we wanna parallelize uh, quick sort. What will we do? Well, what we could do is we could um, carry out the computation of greater and lesser in parallel. That's what this little extra bit of syntax is doing before putting them uh, back together again. And for you know, lists that are um, sufficiently large, this is gonna work out well, right? The two halves of the input list can be constructed in parallel. It's okay because each activity of constructing those lists is independent. They're not gonna interfere in any way. And um, assuming that our list is big enough, um, this, is gonna, this is gonna work out well. I'm gonna have multiple cores, I'm gonna do the split, and um, this is gonna be great. 
Okay, so this was the process of parallelizing one program. This is something that maybe you know you might do when you're writing uh, some code and you want it to run faster. You think, oh, I can make a parallel, and you write by hand a, a parallelization algorithm, or sorry, a uh, you modify your code to parallelize it just like I've shown you here. Now this becomes a PL problem when instead of saying, how do I parallelize this one program? It's, how do I parallelize all programs? How can I, for example, automatically pick components of a program that I might like to parallelize and choose them such that I'm sure that I'm not gonna break the meaning of my program. Um, you know, that the that there isn't gonna be interference. I'm, I'm sure of that. And that the performance is likely gonna improve. So uh, this is a hard problem and our fearless leader for PLMW worked on a problem like this, um, not solving it in the way that I've just described, but in a slightly different way for his PhD thesis, which I have a snapshot here. Okay, so the idea is that PL research is gonna lift a problem, how do I parallelize something from the level of, um, to the level of the language, turning a one-off solution, say for that one program I just parallelized, into a general solution that hopefully works for many, many things. Okay, so if I step back, and I ask the question, well, what is PL research anyway? My answer would be PL research views the programming language as having a central place in solving computing problems. A PL researcher is going to develop general abstractions or building blocks for solving problems or classes of problems, and will consider software behavior in a rigorous and general way, for example, to prove that classes of programs enjoy properties that we want, or maybe uh, askew properties that we don't. The ethos of PL researcher over time has been not to just find solutions to important problems, but to find the best expression of those solutions, typically in the form of a language or a language extension, library, program analysis, or transformation. And the hope is for simple, understandable solutions that are also general. So by being part of or acting at the level of a language, these solutions will apply to many and many sorts of programs and possibly to many sorts of problems. Okay, so from this perspective, you know, PL research is a is a big, high-minded enterprise. It's it's a um, there's lots of ways that we can there are lots of problems that we can solve with this uh, perspective that a PL researcher has developed over time. So uh, PL research tends to have um, several elements to it. So when you look at a PL paper, typically there's some design aspect to it. I've come up with a new language feature. I've developed a new analysis or a new transformation again, at the level of uh, multiple programs or parts of programming languages. Uh, next, I wanna maybe talk about uh, what does my design mean? What does my feature do? What does my analysis do? What does my transformation do? And um, why do I believe that what I'm doing is correct? That if I'm claiming that this analysis finds all possible data races in my program, why do I believe that? What is my mathematical proof that that's actually the case? Uh, PL research often has implementation. How do you implement this new language feature or analysis or transformation? How do I implement my data race detector as a static analysis? What tricks do I have to play for it to be fast, to be um, to not have too many false alarms and, and so on? And then finally, there's often an empirical evaluation where you show that your uh, implementation or your design or some aspect of it makes sense uh, according to uh, its real manifestation. Does the design and implementation do what it is meant to do? And sometimes this, this comes about because we're dealing with uh, intractable or even under, undecidable problems. And so we have some notion of the average or the important case, even if we can't prove something great about the worst case. Okay, so I've given you a little flavor of uh, PL problems. Um, so let's talk for a minute uh, more about those methods. What are the methods that go to uh, fill out those elements of PL research? So um, if you've designed a new feature for a language, well, how do you specify that new feature? If it's a, a syntactic extension, how do you do that? Well, I might use a context-free grammar. I might use a parser generator. I might develop a new kind of parser. I need some way of saying what it is that, uh, that I'm doing. I'm also um, likely to need to describe mathematically what it is, uh, what my feature means. So things like operational semantics or denotational semantics have been developed, again, over decades to describe language features, language designs, that sort of thing. I might like to talk about how I reason about my new language feature or transformation or whatever. Maybe my transformation is uh, a static reasoning tool that is able to understand uh, features of my program according to a logic or a type system. Uh, maybe my static reasoning tool is uh, too imprecise, and so I need to add precision by 
looking at things as they run at runtime by using dynamic reasoning. Uh, and then how do I implement all of this stuff? How do I make my instrumentation fast? How do I compile my language feature? How do I interpret it? How do I connect it to some other language and so on? Okay, so all of these aspects are parts of that toolbox that PL researchers have developed over time in solving uh, these historical problems. Okay, so let's talk about how uh, I view the potential to boost impact when doing PL research. So there's three things I'm gonna talk about. So one um, is expanding the tent. Let's get more people interested or appreciative of programming language research. Second, publish by problem, not technique. The original reason for an area were the problems it was solving, not the techniques it was using, and we should respect that uh, when doing our research. And finally, uh, go after big problems and be collaborative. Okay, so here's the first, expand the tent. So what I mean by that is we want more people interested in PL research. We want more people to know about it, to participate in it, to collaborate with PL researchers. Uh, the more people that are involved, uh, the more impact our work can have. So one way to do that in a way that I've done many times in my career is to apply PL methods, those techniques that were developed for solving PL area problems, but take those methods and apply them to non-PL problems. So you can do this yourself, as I've done by doing research in such areas, um, or you can collaborate with people who do. You can find an expert in a particular domain, bring your programming language's expertise to that collaboration and uh, make something new through the combination. Uh, and of course, you can also just simply tell people about the cool work like this that's taking place. For example, like I'm trying to do on the blogs, but everyone can do uh, themselves. Now on the flip side, another way of expanding the tent is to apply other areas methods to PL problems. So for example, if we apply deep learning for program analysis, we can start to engage all of those people that are super excited about deep learning on PL problems. And in the process, they may come to discover PL methods that we know and love as well. And again, the possibility of collaboration and improvement comes in, but at the least some appreciation and impact is likely to uh, increase along the way. Uh, and finally, if we can lower the barrier to entry for those understanding our work, uh, again, more can appreciate it. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a few examples now of, uh, of doing this, of applying PL methods to non-PL problems and the reverse. Uh, and the first example is a, um, uh, some work that I did in 2014 on a programming language for authenticated data structures. So first of all, what is an authenticated data structure? An authenticated data structure is um, used when you're in the situation that you have a trusted client without very much storage, and you have an untrusted server, which has plenty of storage. And what you would like is you would like the client to be able to query the server and get responses back and have some confidence that those responses are correct. You're not worried about hiding information from the server. You don't have to encrypt that data and get the server to respond. The server can see it. But what you want is that the server will not corrupt your data or it will not um, uh, lie to you when you ask it a question. And it turns out that authenticated data structures are really important for things like blockchain. Uh, if anybody uh, likes uh, Bitcoin uh, or Ethereum or things like this, these all end up using authenticated data structures under the hood for implementing the distributed blockchain. So the first authenticated data structure was the Merkle tree. Uh, invented in 1998. It's a complete binary tree, which is can basically be used to answer questions um, like for uh, arrays. You can, you can think of it as implementing a map. If you have a tree of uh, height n, then there are two to the n elements uh, in the array. And so it's a map from those two to the n elements to whatever values are stored at the leaves um, of, of, the, of the tree. Uh, and it's authenticated. So uh, over time, people have realized, well, complete trees are not the uh, end all be all, and maybe we want other data structures as well that we can use uh, in a way that's also authenticated, sets, dictionaries, graphs, skip lists, you name it. And so basically there's been a cottage industry of uh, researchers building more and more and different authenticated data structures. So when we came along in 2013, we thought, this is crazy. Why do people keep inventing one-offs for these things? Why don't they instead build a programming language for them. Uh, 
So the idea is that instead of um, making something from scratch, improving something about it every time, we can make a simple language extension where the feature that we add to the language is the core of the idea that makes authenticated data structures work. Uh, this is called recursive hashing. So you can add a little primitive to a functional programming language, and from it, you can build all of the authenticated data structures that have happened before. Okay, and what we did was we proved that type correctness in this language implies the authenticity property that we want, but the adversary could only fool a client by inverting a one-way hash. So that means that if you want to make a new authenticated data structure, well, code it up in this language and you're done. No extra proof obligation for you. So how do we do this? Well, we use the standard field toolkit. We uh, defined a language extension. The auth and unauth bits in that little grammar there are the extension. The rest is just a plain old functional programming language. We defined operational semantics that models the one-way nature of hashes. And we compared the different roles of the prover and the verifier in authenticated data structures. We formalized those using an operational semantics. We defined a type system that ensures the proper use of these authenticated hashed values. And then we proved that type safety corresponds with uh, collision resistant, sorry, with uh, authenticity, that only a hash collision can fool the, the server, fool the client. Okay, so this was a way that we took a problem that was essentially an open problem, though people didn't always appreciate that, in the cryptography community, and we solved it using a programming language technique. Okay, here's another example. SQL injection defense. So this is a problem where um, I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, some nasty person can send a fancy input to a web application like Little Bobby Tables did and um, corrupt or otherwise uh, uh, steal information from that database by confusing the application into doing the wrong thing. Uh, and this happens when you uh, take untrusted data and use it in a way that it can break the assumed grammar of the query that's being constructed that you're sending to the server. Uh, and sadly, even today, this is the list from 2021, SQL injection is number six on MITRE's top 25 list for security vulnerabilities. So uh, back in 2007, Zendong Su and Gary Wasserman realized that this is a parsing problem, that the reason SQL injections happen is that uh, adversaries are able to break out of the intended structure of the query and manipulate that query to do something different. So they know, defined a notion of what they called syntactic confinement for parsing strings via grammar, and then performed, designed a program analysis for a web application to see whether entrusted data could flow to a part of the SQL query that was not syntactically confined. Uh, and they did a, a use a so-called string analysis to do that. Uh, and then they proved their analysis was sound, that all SQL injection strings will violate syntactic confinement and no violation means no vulnerabilities. So what they did was, it turns out up until this time, there were many ad hoc solutions for SQL injection proposed, but they weren't really getting at the heart of the matter, which was the, this issue of confinement in terms of the, the non-terminals that are part of the grammar that's being parsed for the SQL query. And so these guys figured out what it was, they formalized it in PL terms and um, were able to come up with a general solution. Okay, and my last example is uh, verifying data planes. So this is the uh, internet in the United States. And it turns out that the internet is often misconfigured. Uh, it's possible that when a particular company is setting up their routing tables and doing uh, complicated things, they may end up making nodes unreachable or making nodes reachable that shouldn't be. They might route packets to the wrong place. They might harm quality of, quality of service by making routing loops. Uh, and obviously they would like to avoid these things. Over time, the internet um, infrastructure has become more programmable. It's less sort of burned in, into hardware and more uh, the domain of special purpose languages. So it turns out there's a language called P4 for programming what are called data planes. So this is an example P4 program. And uh, a bunch of folks at a startup company at Cornell at Stanford realized, hey, we should be able to verify that P4 programs do what they should. And therefore these properties of the overall internet that we dislike we can prove that they don't happen. So this is the application of formal methods uh, in the traditional sense developed all the way back in the 60s to the problem of routing misconfiguration in networks, specifically by looking at programs written in P4. So um, all of the features of the P4 work or, or the P4V work, I should say, you would recognize. There's a so-called guarded command language. This is based on work by Dijkstra 
It's not so different for P4 than it was for uh, imperative programs from back then. There is a definition of weakest liberal preconditions, which is a way of generating a logical formula about the behavior of programs written in P4. And then there is a way that we can turn those preconditions into verification conditions, which we can send off to an automated prover, um, for example, Z3, where failure of proof implies that the property you want, for example, the lack of routing loops does not hold. So they built this tool and uh, used it to verify interesting P4 network programs. Uh, and this paper was published in, in SIGCOM uh, recently. Now we can also go the other way. I mentioned already machine learning for PL problems. So this is um, work by folks at um, UPenn, uh, UPenn, Georgia Tech, Google on detecting and finding bugs in programs. That's a classic PL problem, but they're using not traditional PL methods. They're using deep learning to do it. Uh, and they did it by analyzing a huge corpus of JavaScript programs uh, and one line changes to those programs that they could use to signal a bug fix. And then they could train on that information in order to um, find other bugs in programs they didn't train on. Uh, a related problem is refactoring and auto-completion, say as part of your IDE. And once again, rather than standard PL techniques, you could imagine using deep learning to do this. So getting people to use PL methods or understand their value is difficult because while everyone knows the notation that's used in machine learning and many other areas of computer science, fewer people know the notation that's used in PL, which is logical rules of inference. My perception is that you know, folks will, may have been forced to take a logic class in graduate school or undergraduate school, but then they probably forgot it because <clears throat> they basically never used it. So if they open up a Popple paper or an ICFP paper and they see all of this uh, math, that's not necessarily bad, but it's math that they don't understand. So um, somehow I think we need to address this problem. We need to either have better education. Certainly uh, folks already interested in PL have opportunities like the Oregon Programming Languages Summer School or this, the Programming Languages Mentoring Workshop. But maybe there can be other things we do too, like online tutorials, something like distill.pub for PL. Uh, that's currently for machine learning papers. Maybe there's something we can do for PL. And I think we could also do better to standardize our notation. Everybody likes their own particular way of writing uh, formalizations down. And uh, once you sort of become in the know and understand how to read these things, this isn't a problem, but I think it is a big barrier for entry. All right, let's go to impact boost number two, which is to publish by problem rather than by technique. So um, like I said in, in the little, uh, looking back the history of programming languages research, the programming languages area grew up around the problems of programming languages. How do we specify languages? How do we implement them? Uh, how do we reason about them? And then those problems uh, and the solutions to them were parts of conferences or journals. And then over time, that community of people became experts in various uh, PL methods. Then what happened is that people who are experts in PL methods started applying those methods to new problems, but still publishing them in PL venues. So for example, uh, I did this with that authenticated data structures paper. I published that in Popple. So that's arguably a cryptography problem, but I published the solution in a programming languages venue. Why did I do that? Well, I'll say that in a minute. On the flip side, um, an example of the opposite is the P4 paper. This is a paper about a networking problem. How do I do routing properly? And the answer is, well, you can use formal verification to make sure that your routing programs are, are doing what you meant. And the people who own that problem, the SIGCOM community, uh, published that paper. Now, at the same time, you might use PL problem solutions um, that, sorry, you might develop PL problem solutions in a non-PL method. So for example, maybe you use machine learning to uh, figure out how to do compilation or how to uh, find, do bug finding. Uh, my suggestion is we should be publishing those papers in PL venues because as the problem owners, um, we are interested in those solutions. We want to bring those new methods over to our problems so that more and more people can learn about them and see their application and also judge how well they really fare against the more traditional methods. So for example, the code to vec paper, the second I showed you a moment ago was in Popple, but the Hoppity paper, the one just before that was in the ICLR. Uh, and in fact, this recommendation that I'm making now comes from Meyer Nyack, who is the co-author of that ICLR paper he felt that basically the ICLR community was not appreciating really the work that he was doing. They just failed to, um, 
to understand it because it's not a problem area that they're used to. And at the same time, the PL community doesn't regularly read ICLR. And so then they're not up on this method being maybe the best method for solving a problem. And it's best to at the least, um, you know, publish something in a PL community, uh, PL venue so that they can understand it better. So doing both of these things, um, have the opportunity to expand connections to other areas, to bring more people that didn't start with PL methods or PL problems to appreciate both of those things. Now, the challenge with doing this is, of course, reaching the audience. You know, why is it that I published that authenticated data structures paper in the Popple menu? Well, it's because I didn't expect that if I sent it to a computer communication security conference, that those reviewers would necessarily know what operational semantics and type systems and all that stuff was, and therefore they would reject the paper because they didn't understand it or they didn't appreciate it. Uh, on the flip side, PL reviewers have the same problem with um, non-PL, traditional PL methods like machine learning. It might be difficult for them to review it. So this creates a challenge as the areas are growing by accepting, uh, learning new methods or even new problems for that matter. So there's going to be this growing pain where there's a failure to publish because people don't understand what you're doing and they don't uh, recognize that. So the hope is that, you know, persevere. Try, maybe try one or two more times than you would for a regular paper to a, a traditional TPL venue. Um, and if that doesn't work out, maybe you can find a way to split what you've done into papers that make sense in the PL venue and in the, the Area X venue. I think another problem is that ultimately our methods need to be understood by people outside the area that developed them outside of PL. And so I would suggest that we need to develop, do more specifically on technical outreach. For example, short monographs that explain PL techniques or ideas, you know, not full textbooks. Um, a SIGCOM researcher probably doesn't have time to pick up um, Bob Harper's book or Benjamin Pierce's book or a static analysis book or whatever, uh, but maybe they may have time to read a 15 or 20 page paper. So as an example, the security community have, uh, has papers called systematization of knowledge papers. And in 2010, they published this paper, um, all you ever wanted to know about taint analysis or forward symbolic execution and might have been afraid to ask. And this paper is about, as it turns out, PL techniques, taint flow analysis and symbolic execution, but it was published at a security venue so that it was in terms that security researchers would hopefully understand while not compromising on the notation and the techniques that were developed in the PL community. And um, they use operational semantics type rules, analysis techniques. And this paper has been cited 850 times by now. So it, it has definitely uh, been valuable for that community. Okay, so my last suggestion is to go big and go collaborative. So, um, Big problems have big impact. That's why they're big problems. And there are lots of big problems that the world is facing right now. From um, Just from the news, we're worried a lot about privacy and ensuring consumer privacy. We're worried about fairness in uh, decision-making algorithms. We're worried about the spread of disinformation. We're worried quite a lot about the security of computer systems from break-ins, from, um, from ecosystem compromises, supply chains, and so on. But even moving away from computer systems, uh, energy, climate, surely there are things that uh, computer scientists have to say about the big problems of our day. If we join or organize collaborations that tackle big pressing problems for which PL offers ideas that are part of that solution, then almost by definition, we're increasing our impact. But in addition to the impact of the direct solutions to those problems, we're also, again, broadening that tent. We're educating our collaborators about the stuff that we do. We're being um, more inclusive of their views on the kind of work that we do. I've had the pleasure of working on many collaborations with, for example, cryptographers um, or quantum computing theorists. And you know, I learn a lot by talking to them and they learn a lot more about programming languages research not just about our particular collaboration, but about the whole field. And then I, I feel like I've done my job in contributing to that work, but also showing them that this is a field that they might return to, to look for solutions to other problems. So here's a few examples um, of projects that have gone big and gone collaborative. So uh, Project Everest is a really amazing work that folks have done to develop a highly efficient, fully verified component 
uh, fully verified components of an HTTPS stack. Uh, this was, I believe, started at Microsoft, but they have collaborators now at INRIA, Carnegie Mellon, and the Joint Center between Microsoft and, and INRIA. Actually, I think it was those two, the Joint Center and Microsoft, that were the, the starters of that. So uh, along the way, um, there have been contributions made by PL researchers doing things like new uh, logics, new language designs, new solving algorithms, new compilation strategies, uh, new proof strategies. But there's also been contributions from system security researchers, from cryptographers who write the actual cryptography code that ends up getting verified, uh, from people who think in terms of threat models on the security side and how things will be deployed. And you can see publications from Project Everest in all of the domains that cover these areas. And the impact of Project Everest has been tremendous. It's uh, deployed in pretty much, you know, chances are you're using software right now or you're communicating with software that has some of the cryptography that they've developed running in it. An older example is the DARPA Crash Safe program. So this was, uh, I think, 2011, 2012. And the goal of this program was to reimagine secure computing infrastructure, sort of a combined effort that says things are so terrible right now because all of the internet, all of uh, computing was built without thinking enough about security. We were really serious about security in the late 80s and we dumped it in the 90s and maybe we need a full rethink. So let's start from the ground up. How will we build a secure system today? So Crash Safe brought together computer architects, systems researchers, security researchers, and as it turned out, programming languages researchers to address this problem, to look all the way down to the level of the architecture, but also the operating system and uh, the application developer and looked at ways that these things could work together to build better security. Uh, and it's fun because if you think about it, you know, these folks were thinking about architectures that would have ruled out problems like Spectre and Meltdown right from the start. And, uh, you know, of course, now we're, we're paying for our lack of attention being paid to architectural level security by having to deal with, in, it seems like a complete cottage industry of these sorts of uh, hardware level side channels. Okay, and my last example is uh, MIT's Center for Deployable Machine Learning. The goal of this center is to build ML systems that are safe, robust, and reliable, enough to be confidently and responsibly deployed or in the real world. And um, you would think, oh, well, that's going to be a bunch of machine learning people. But actually, if you look at the list of folks that are associated with this center, they're involved in many disciplines, including programming languages. So uh, Armando Solar Lezama, in particular, is a member of the center. And he probably publishes at this point half in PL, doing works, for example, on program synthesis, but also work uh, related to program synthesis related methods for doing uh, machine learning tasks. All right, so as you can see, PL has a substantial toolbox of mathematics and implementation techniques that are widely applicable. And with these, we can make it, whatever it is, more general, more elegant, more direct, more efficient, more reliable, more secure than you could maybe before. But despite the great promise of uh, our toolbox, we can do more to make others aware of it and to overall increase the impact of our work. And maybe some of these ideas um, suggest to you ways that we can do that. So as a recap, what is PL research? It is a, a research that views the programming language as having a central place in solving computing problems. A PL researcher is going to develop general abstractions or building blocks for solving problems of classes of problems. And PL research considers software behavior in a rigorous and general way. In terms of increasing the impact of this research, we can expand the tent by applying PL methods to other problems or do the reverse. And we can educate others and also simplify our notation and our methods to make it more accessible to them. We can publish by problem, not by technique, again, to welcome others and to show them the benefits of our approaches. And we can go big and go collaborative. And I thank you for your attention. That's all I have to say. Speaker. Um, so we have a, a, a question already. Uh, let me show it on the stage. Uh, it's from Lindsay. Uh, any advice on how to make a PL methods for Area X paper palatable to Area X program committees? Co-author with a true Area X person, perhaps? Is that is that the best way? And uh, before I let you answer that, uh, Simon uh, Peyton Jones in in the same chat, I think, has a related comment, which was. Um, 
he a little bit stronger. He's saying you must have a co-author from that community. They have different culture, vocabulary, conventions. And without a local guide, it's extremely difficult to pitch it right. Do you agree with that uh, assessment? I would say um, that has been the formula I have used, I think, in every case. So I think I do agree with it. Um, right. The T4 paper that I just that I mentioned during the talk, that um, you can see that has a bunch of networking folks on it. Uh, Nick McEwen, mm -hmm. for example, from Stanford, he's a networking guy. But then, you know, the PL person who was that, that was Nate Foster from, from Cornell. Uh, yeah. For my authentic authenticated data structures paper, Elaine Shee and Jonathan Katz were the cryptographers who were involved. And, you know, I brought the PL expertise. So I do think that that's a, that's a very good approach. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. And, uh, you know, in, in this goal of trying to find, you know, problems in other communities where PL techniques might do very well and then have high impact in those communities. Um, what comes to my mind is like a lot of people who are in academia, you're kind of around people from other areas all the time. And yet we seem to not take advantage of that very much. Do you have thoughts on on that? You know, I know that seems kind of minor, but like we're passing each other in the halls, right? Like what's 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 the problem there? Yeah, that's a great question. I I don't, well, I, um, I guess I don't have that problem personally. Uh, sure. For example, I have a Sigmod paper this year with my database's colleague. <clears throat> sure. Because uh, when he was interviewing and we were talking about a problem idea that made sense, I guess maybe this is part of the trick is that uh, you need to find an occasion to talk to people in areas outside of yours at a level right. that you're both comfortable. I think sometimes we're a little worried about saying too much because people don't understand what we say or we're too afraid to show that we don't know what they're talking about. So somehow, you know, if you can create a situation where you can have an honest dialogue where you're open, maybe you go out to lunch frequently, uh, just you have a chance to talk about ideas in a casual way, I think then you can start to come together and see how um, a collaboration could unfold. At least that's the way often it is. I mean, again, those two papers that I just mentioned, this paper we had at Sigmod, but then this, the ADS paper, those just came out of casual conversations with those folks. Uh, and I'm, you know, for the ADS paper, I'm like, why are we not, why are you not formalizing it this way? Why is it not this approach? And then we started that conversation. Right, right. Fair enough. Um, uh, S SPJ has another uh, question. So building cross area partnerships here, let me put it on the stage. Uh, carries quite heavy overheads, learning each other's vocabulary, identifying problems that lie in the intersection. This can take time. Is that easier for tenured professors than for graduate students? Well, um, I would say that most of the time, what I see is that the tenured professors kind of strike up the collaboration, but the graduate students carry it out. And so then the graduate students um, are the ones who are forced to do that hard work. And I guess the question is, you know, how, did, how does it turn out for them? Um, well, I, as an example with the ADS paper again, so Andrew Miller was the first author in that paper. He came from kind of a cryptography background, but he learned a ton of PL stuff and came to appreciate it as a result. Uh, and then he went off and became a professor at UIUC. He has a paper that he invented, uh, he had a language he invented called Hawk for blockchain programs. And this is an incredibly influential piece of work that came directly out of the, you know, the insights and appreciation that he got from the PL research that we had done. So I would say it, it is, does carry a lot of overhead and graduate students are often the ones who bear that overhead. And I guess in the best case, they also bear a lot of the benefit too. Right. Um, it is a risk. I appreciate that. Fair enough. Uh, and, and Simon also says, PS, you sound really good at these casual conversations. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have another question here. Do you have any suggestions to improve the incentives to write more of these explanatory monographs you mentioned? Um, and this comes up a lot on Twitter, right? Yes, you've probably. That's a great it. question. Yeah. yeah, I I wish I had I, I wish I had a good answer to that. I mean, I guess another question. So I don't think people write textbooks for money anymore. Uh, at least whenever I was approached about writing a textbook, and then they told me. How much money I was likely to make. It was like, I'm not doing this for the money if I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I think it's a good thing to do. So I think that's the problem is that uh, somehow you have to you have to believe that it's a good thing to do and you have to hope for the best. I mean, it right. can be helpful to your career. So that um, example paper I, I showed has a ton of citations. I'm thinking of another example. Um, Andre Sabelfeld and Andrew Myers published a paper back in like 2001 on an overview of uh, information flow control techniques. So they had been around for 10 years, but there were so many techniques that people didn't know about them. 
And so they put a bunch of time, they made a survey paper, and then that paper has been hugely influential in growing the area. So I, the only incentive to my mind is, um, you know, it will have, it will have the, you, you will hope that it has the desired outcome of broadening the community. Actually, I'll, I'll say that there's a secondary benefit, which is um, you learn a ton by writing this stuff, right? Everybody knows that by teaching something, you learn it better. By writing, you learn it even better than that because you right. don't get to make a mistake and then it just goes into the past. It's a, it's a mistake you would make forever. So you're going to have to write it better. Right. Uh, that would be another potential benefit of writing it. But in terms of, you know, why aren't more people doing it? I, I don't know. I can only make the case that I'm making now to say it's sure. worth it. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to build on that question. Um, when researchers have blogs, you know, you you had the PL enthusiast or still have the PL enthusiast. I know Lindsay also uh, has a blog. Um, what I've heard from people who have run these blogs, which take a lot of time and it, it takes energy, is that usually they do get benefit from it, right? There is some something they're getting back. It's not just going out into the ether. And often this is the stuff that breaks out of our community, right? The blog posts are the things that get shared around and uh, people we would have never imagined reading it are the ones reading it. And yet it still seems difficult, you know, and I'm I'm in this camp, but it still seems difficult to like do it, to get it going. You know, do you have thoughts about, you know, how, how do you yeah. stick with it? Well, I would say um, for graduate students, actually having a blog is kind of a nice thing for practicing your writing. I'm, I, you know, we've had talks today at PLNW about how to write well. And of course, one way to write better is to um, follow the advice by practice. Well, what will you practice on? You could practice on writing technical papers, but there's only so many opportunities to do that. But you certainly can write um, things that you're interested in that are smaller scale that might um, happen to tickle some of the impact outreach ideas that I'm talking about. But I think it's just good separately to have a blog where you put your thoughts to to paper, as it were, because I think you just learn a ton by doing that. The, the process of writing is a process by which you're solidifying things. I always learn more about the research I did when I'm writing the paper than I did when I wasn't writing the paper. Right. Uh, Simon, right. Simon is here. So Simon has this great uh, talk about, you know, write the paper first and then do the research. Right. I definitely have, w once I saw that, took that to heart, that the writing process should be interleaved with the research process, that you're always thinking about how do I explain this? What are these ideas? And uh, if you make it on a blog, other people can read it too. So who knows? Who right. knows where it can go? Yeah, fair enough. Um, uh, Ninning uh, asks, what about or how about people who are doing PL for PL? Do they sound less impactful now? Lula. Right, right. Um, so I, I should have said, I should have made a disclaimer, and I'm glad you asked me this uh, at the beginning, that this is not the only way to have uh, impact. Certainly, there are. It's very. There's a super important core PL work using core PL methods um, that that is going on now on how to build languages, how to um, build garbage collectors, how to build thread systems, how to program the newest forms of computers. I mean, you name it. There's there's so many things that are going on that are just core PL. That uh, of course somebody needs to do them, and uh, there is an opportunity for impact there. Right. So right. I guess I just want to. I don't want to send the message that that's uh, not a way to do impact. It's really, I'm speaking to the whole community. How can we increase impact as a community so that more people uh, appreciate the work that we do, which hopefully will come around to appreciating the core PL work too. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think part of what I took from your talk is you also want to prevent like the own goals a little bit, right? You have this great problem to, or great solution <laughs> to, to a problem that other people face. And when we publish it here, uh, it may not, it may not be as impactful. When that same work that you've already done might have a bigger impact being published elsewhere. You know, uh, do you think that's a fair representation of what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think I think especially. Um, I mean, the the Sig Plan is a healthy community, right? There's 2,000 registered Sig Plan members. When conferences were in person, we were having 550 people going to those conferences. That's good. But if you if you put stack sig plan up to machine learning, right? I mean, it's just not even in the same order of magnitude. Right. And uh, when you look at grad school applications, it's the same. The number that are interested in PL and software engineering compared to AI and machine learning, it's like an order of magnitude different. And and why is that? Um, well, they're in, they're super excited about that idea: automated reasoning, artificial intelligence, machine learning. But actually, you know, we kind of do that too. Right. Um, they just don't know it. 
And th those people who are interested in those topics don't realize, wow, there's a whole lot to be gained by proper sort of formal methods, logics, soundness, and so on, and not informal or, or, or uh, imprecise. I, that's not the right word. Incomplete. Uh, machine learning is not going to give you uh, the full answer all the time, right? So sure, sure. being able to show folks that there's more going on, hey, over in this neck of the woods, maybe some people will realize um, that there's something to be gained by paying attention. Actually, I have one more uh, anecdote about that. So Project Everest, uh, one of the leaders of that project is Nikhil Swamy, who's at Microsoft. Nick was my student at the University of Maryland. He did not come to University of Maryland to work with me in programming languages. He came to work on AI, but somehow he took my class or something and he had a, a change of mind, which led him to basically do automated reasoning, but from a PL perspective. And it led, you know, he did this fantastic work uh, all throughout his PhD and afterwards. So maybe we can show the world the same thing. Right. Uh, and Simon has another comment. PL is about the building of materials and techniques. Other areas are about the buildings themselves. Uh, there are going to be more building builders than brick makers, and rightly so. Um, we do tend to be a community that loves thinking about the tools, you know, we, uh, and worry less about what the tools are used for sometimes to our own detriment. But um. Yeah, and we need to see other people uh, to, to we need them to realize that we have some great tools and right. uh, we need to realize that our tools can apply to more areas than we thought. Right. Uh, and so, uh, oh, one last question. Okay, we probably have enough time. We're, we're already being cheeky, but we'll ask this and it's, it'll be the last one. Um, uh, so I hate to be, oh, I'll, I'll share it on the, on the stage. I hate to be cynical, but I'm worried that beyond intellectual growth of the field, the most common impact of PL is just saving tech companies money in crashes, refactors, engineer onboarding, tech department. Uh, I guess that's tech debt. Is this a worry for you? Hmm. I guess uh, that's what I thought I was getting into. Yeah. Uh, so I get if you're if you're saying um, we should make great results that tech companies will pick up and do these things, but we may not be applauded for it because behind the scenes they take advantage of our hard work. Um, I guess I'm not worried about that. I think that that is that that's a fair point. I would still find that rewarding. I would, I would still be glad for that. Um, I, 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 I yeah, got or, because I was worried that I felt that software could be built better, and I wanted to figure out ways to do that. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't speak for Joshua, but I'm wondering if maybe the question was about like, is that is that to a good end? Um, although you know, I that's that might be something we have to take offline. But I think you know the question of how the tools are used is is an important one, um, uh, and and there's a lot of debate there, uh, mm -hmm. uh, sure. all over the place. But okay, so let's thank uh, Mike one last time for for this talk. Uh, lots of food for thought.